Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I suppose it is my duty to introduce uh, my colleague, my uh, office neighbor, and my good friend, Norm Miao. Uh, Norman was born in, uh, guess where, Norman, Oklahoma. And I just think how lucky he was not to have been born, let's say, in Rehovot, Israel, like I was, or in Poughkeepsie, or something like that. Anyhow, he made his way to Harvard University, uh, where he was an undergraduate, and then he stayed to perform his uh, graduate work also. Uh, Norm began dabbling in biophysics there, but then turned to theoretical quantum information science, quantum optics, and atomic physics. Um, he completed his PhD under the supervision of uh, Misha Lukin and was awarded the Damov thesis prize for that work. Uh, we were very fortunate to attract Norm to UC Berkeley by means of a fellowship from the Miller Institute for Basic Research in Science. Um, as a postdoc, he conducted a wide range of research, which is really typical of him. Uh, and as part of that, he deepened his activity in condensed matter physics and, again, quantum information science. He collaborated with many faculty members at Berkeley during that time. Uh, we made a very good call to hire Norm to uh, Berkeley when the chance came up. Together with Ehud Altman, Norm has founded a world-leading theoretical AMO physics presence at Berkeley. Um, and as if that weren't impressive enough, Norm has also established an experimental physics lab and his group is now producing leading results in quantum sensing using NB defects in diamond. Uh, I often joke that theorists, sorry, that experimentalists are theorists who can also do experiments. And now Norm is teaching us that theorists are experimentalists who can also do theory. Uh, Norm is well known for his vibrant research activity and by way of notoriety, let me mention that Norm was awarded the 2020 Valley Prize of the American Physical Society. Um, so just a reminder to everybody who's listening, remember to uh, ask questions. There will be uh, a couple of breaks during the talk to address those questions, but you can submit them in the uh, Q&A function on Zoom, or you can put them in the chat window uh, on the uh, streaming uh, YouTube page. And with that, let me um, turn the floor to Norm. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for that, that introduction. It can only go downhill from here. But uh, nonetheless, let me thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit about some ongoing experiments in my group focused on looking at and trying to explore the emergence of hydrodynamics in strongly interacting dipolar spin ensembles. So this is ongoing work on the experimental side. Some of the physics on the theory side is in this uh, PRL that was published last week. So let me start by trying to contextualize a little bit the flavor of the broader question that this talk will try to answer. And in particular, the starting point is really a strongly interacting many body microscopic Hamiltonian, H. And oftentimes, perhaps the most standard question that we're used to asking in AMO and condensed matter physics is what is the nature of the ground state of such a strongly interacting Hamiltonian? Could it be that the ground state has some type of interesting symmetry breaking pattern? Could it be that the ground state has some type of topological order? And these types of low temperature questions are kind of a very standard, um, a very standard direction that one thinks about given such a Hamiltonian. The focus of my talk today is on something that's very different from that. And it'll be kind of far away from this conventional low temperature limit where one's thinking about ground state physics. And rather it's asking the question, what do the dynamics driven by the Hamiltonian look like? And in particular, is it possible that despite the fact that the dynamics are driven by a very complicated many body quantum object, that there might be a simple description of how the dynamics transport interesting quantities at late times. On a slightly more broader note, the kind of, both the input and the output of, this, um, of these two sides are, are interesting and kind of make this, the complexity of this question um, particularly vibrant and the subject of lots of exploration. On the Hamiltonian side, there's many, many different inputs at the level of the Hamiltonian, ranging from disordered systems, systems that thermalize, systems that don't thermalize. In addition to um, lots of dichotomy at the level of the Hamiltonian, there's also many different ways to take a system out of equilibrium. For example, one can look at quench dynamics, dissipation, or periodic driving. In addition to there being lots and lots of different inputs, this corresponding um, diversity leads to many different outputs as well on the phenomenological side. There's questions related to whether or not quantum information scrambles and how it scrambles or how quantum systems achieve chaos. 
questions related on the ordered side to how strong disorder leads to the protection of um, different types of ordering. And the focus of my talk today is really on something that's called emergent hydrodynamics, which is trying to understand in what types of situations and what things look like when quantum systems ultimately have a very simple description in terms of classical hydrodynamics at late times. So that's the focus of the, of the talk today. Let me give just a little bit of a roadmap and also emphasize that there will be two kind of short intermissions where people are really strongly encouraged to ask questions. Um, I'll start by kind of explaining a little bit of background in trying to familiarize ourselves with what I mean when I talk about emergent hydrodynamics. I'll go through what I call the lore, the intuition, and kind of the ingredients. Then building upon these ingredients, I'll explain our experimental platform in our group, which contains two strongly interacting species of spin defects in diamond. And we'll walk through each of these ingredients and how the experimental platform realizes them. After describing the platform, I'll go into a little bit of a theory digression and try to explain how the features, some of the central features of the platform, namely the presence of very strong disorder and long range interactions lead to modifications, interesting modifications of diffusion. And then we'll come back to the experiments and take a look together at how one can explore unconventional diffusion in this particular platform. Having done a dry run about an hour ago, I'm, I'm not sure I'll get to the outlook, but hopefully I'll be able to summarize at the end and, and tell you a little bit about some other recent projects we're working on on the landscape of many body cooling and dimensionality control. So emergent hydrodynamics. The lore of this notion of emergent hydrodynamics is that even though we might be given a strongly interacting microscopic quantum Hamiltonian, that perhaps the late time dynamics of conserved quantities, for example, energy if one has a time independent Hamiltonian or spin if one has a Hamiltonian that conserves spin might be governed by a simpler theory than the naive sort of full quantum dynamics of the system. And in particular, these conserved quantities may be governed by kind of classical differential equations that look like what we have from hydrodynamics. And when I say hydrodynamics, you should really be thinking in the back of your mind something that kind of looks like, you know, the simplest example being the diffusion equation. For this particular audience, one might naturally ask, is this particular lore really all that surprising? In particular, in AMO systems, we're often used to thinking about open quantum systems, whether this be decay from a cavity or spontaneous emission from an atom. And oftentimes, the sort of feeling that we have is that the quantum correlations, the intrinsic quantum correlations of a system naturally get defased at late times, coming from the fact that the system is really open and interacting with an environment. And this should perhaps unsurprisingly lead to sort of classical transport of conserved quantities since all the quantum correlations have been defaced. On the other hand, what we really mean when we talk about emergent hydrodynamics and this has become clear in the next slide especially is that here we're really thinking about the dynamics of a closed quantum system. And the lore is that despite the fact that we have a closed quantum system not interacting with an environment, that somehow the many body dynamics drive the system to still have some type of a classical description at late times. This lore is, has been kind of an enduring, I would say, mathematical physics challenge for many decades. Trying to prove that it happens for a generic many particle system is one of the kind of big open questions of the field. But even um, trying to be a little bit less ambitious than proving that it happens generically, given a microscopic quantum Hamiltonian and trying to predict what the kind of hydrodynamical properties of the system are, what the, for example, diffusion coefficient is, what the viscosity is, what the compressibility are, this is tremendously challenging. There's no, there's neither an analytic or a numerical tool that kind of generically allows one to make these predictions. So the focal point of today's talk is really to explore and try to understand the emergence of hydrodynamics in an experimental platform. And that's a platform that features, in addition to many body interactions, interactions that are on top of a strongly disordered system and that are driven by uh, dipolar interactions. With this lore in mind, I wanted to give a little bit of an intuition for both, both of the individual words 
both emergent and hydrodynamics. And I wanted to do this by kind of um, making an analogy to something that everyone I'm sure in the audience is, is quite familiar with. So we'll start with the word hydrodynamics. And hydro, I think the, for the purpose of this talk, it's useful to think about hydrodynamics as really starting with a microscopic physical process and somehow combining the sort of degrees of freedom and coarse graining in some way such that one ultimately ends up with a macroscopic description with the hope that that macroscopic description is simple and, uh, and elegant. So the, the example that everyone knows very well is if you have, for example, classical particles random walking that one can kind of coarse grain naively, there's sort of a, a polarization per lattice site, but one can sort of coarse grain this polarization into a variable P that's sort of continuous. And it turns out that the macroscopic description of this kind of classical random walk is what we now know as sort of classic diffusion. Of course, the kind of quantum case um, leads to some surprises. The same situation of a single quantum particle kind of moving on a lattice ultimately leads to ballistic motion. And the reason why there's the word emergent in front of hydrodynamics when we think about a many body quantum system is it's really that in a many body quantum system, we think about interactions between these quantum particles as ultimately taking us away from the single particle ballistic limit to again diffusion, but where the diffusion emerges as a consequence of the many body interactions in the system. It's kind of the way to think about um, these two words together and broadly what the physics is. So uh, this field of emergent hydrodynamics and trying to understand uh, what the late time dynamics of conserved quantity looks like in strongly interacting quantum systems has a, a long history, both on the theory side as well as uh, in terms of many, many different experimental systems that have explored this question, ranging from condensed matter systems to different AMO systems, both in bosonic and fermionic systems, as well as to NMR systems, which are focused on spin degrees of freedom. So let's start by trying to understand a little bit if one wants to explore this question of how hydrodynamics looks and emerges in a strongly interacting quantum system, what types of ingredients does one have to have in the experimental system? First, we need a conserved quantity so that we can kind of well-define thinking about dynamics of this conserved quantity. And in our system, it'll particularly be uh, spin polarization that's conserved. So we'll think about spin polarization profiles moving around. And that already kind of alludes to the second point which is that one needs to be able to make inhomogeneous profiles as one sees on the screen of this conserved density. And it's only with this inhomogeneous profiles that one can sort of watch how things move. And this is precisely uh, leads us to the ingredients three and four, which is that we want to be able to watch how the subsequent quantum dynamics involve under, for example, different experimental conditions and driven by these different experimental conditions, we'd like to ask ourselves whether and how different is the emergent description of the late time physics of this inhomogeneous profile. And perhaps the most important thing, given that I mentioned late time, is that is the fourth ingredient here, which is that one really wants to have an experimental tool set to be able to distinguish between what I think of as kind of non-universal local dynamics of the system and the sort of more universal regime where we're reaching late time emergent hydrodynamics. So in the next sort of uh, section uh, of the talk, I'll sort of focus on these four ingredients and we'll slowly kind of walk through the experimental platform and we'll, within the, within the experimental platform context, we'll kind of answer the question of how each of these ingredients kind of shows up and is realized in the experiment. So the experimental platform that my group uh, plays with is really a, a strongly coupled ensemble of spin qubits in diamond. And there's two flavors of spin qubits that we play with um, and that are important for this particular system. So diamond itself natively is a tetrahedrally bonded lattice of carbon atoms. And one of the spin qubits is the so-called nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. It corresponds to a specific defect inside the diamond lattice where a single nitrogen impurity replaces one of the carbon atoms and it happens to be adjacent to a vacant lattice site. 
this ends up being a spin one qubit. So it's a three level system. And we like to think of this as the controllable local probe for the experiments that I'll tell you about. The second spin defect or the second spin qubit in our system is very similar, at least from the defect structure, the ND center. It corresponds to a substitutional nitrogen impurity now no longer adjacent to any vacancies. This is called a P1 center. And this P1 center is a spin one half degree of freedom. So it's really a qubit or typically represented in my slides as spin up and spin down. Whereas I'll represent the states of the NB center as MS zero minus one and plus one. And for the purposes of this talk, the system that's really the strongly interacting dynamical system of which we'll be exploring hydrodynamics is really this P1 ensemble. And to kind of hammer that home even a little bit more, let me emphasize that we've chosen the, um, chosen the sample that the system is, uh, is in um, to have a very, very different density between these two types of spins. In particular, the P1 spins, the spin one half P1 centers are at a density of about 110 parts per million. This gives an average spacing between P1 spins on the order of three and a half nanometers. On the other hand, the NV centers are about a hundred times less dense at the level of half to one part per million. And this means that the average spacing between NV centers is on the order of 20 nanometers or so. Should emphasize that the distance between the NV and the P1 center is again, similar to the P1 to P1 distance, but the distance between two NV centers is uh, significantly further apart. So this kind of geometry already naturally alludes to one super important property of the system that I'll want everyone to keep in mind, which is that there's strong positional disorder in the system in the sense that not every lattice site is filled with a, with a P1 center or an NV center. The sort of lattice spacing diamond is a couple of angstroms, but here the spacing between these different types of spins is on the level of a couple of nanometers. So all of the positions, there's strong positional disorder that's kind of intrinsic to this experimental system. We kind of get ingredient one, which is this conservation law that we need to be able to define thinking about local dynamics for free by just thinking carefully about the types of dynamics that um, are driven by the Hamiltonian. And in particular, the many body Hamiltonian that drives the dynamics for a system will be the magnetic dipole-dipole interaction. The combination of this magnetic dipole-dipole interaction, which we've written down here, and the presence of a magnetic field in the experiment means that in general, the energy only energy conserving terms of the dipole-dipole interaction will play a role in moving spin polarization or moving spin density around. So it turns out energy conservation coming on top of the dipole-dipole interaction naturally leads to an effective Hamiltonian, which as you can see, conserves the total number of spin excitations. The Ising piece trivially does that, and the flip-flop piece only allows one to sort of move polarization between spins, but doesn't allow us to change the total spin excitation number. So in order to get to the second piece of the uh, in second ingredient, we should understand a little bit better what exactly I mean by control of the local quantum probe. And in particular, what I mean by that is really optical control of the NV center. So most of the experiments I'm going to tell you about are at room temperature. And what this means is that the three level system that I told you to think about as the ground state of this NV center, this spin one system are all equally populated if one doesn't do anything. So the population is kind of incoherently one third, one third and one third between these three sub levels. There's naturally an energy splitting of the system that's a couple of gigahertz. It turns out that perhaps the, the reason why the solid state system is most like an, an atomic system and has been uh, particularly well explored is that there exists a path for optical pumping under green excitation. And via shining 532 nanometer light, one can optically pump almost all of the population from the MS minus one and plus one states to the zero state so that one can initialize this qubit in the sort of M sub, MS sub zero state to be able to prepare the state of the system. At the same time, the same route that allows for optical pumping actually also allows for optical readout of the quantum state, precisely because 
these two, these three different quantum levels, these three different sublevels actually have very different fluorescence rates. And in particular, MS sub zero fluoresces about 30 times, 30% uh, more than MS minus one and plus one. So the basic control of the system is done optically and one can both prepare the initial state of the system as well as read out the quantum state of the system. In addition, once one's prepared the system in the MS sub zero state, one can coherently manipulate between the population between these different spin sublevels by using microwave driving. So for example, if one's resonant from the zero to minus one transition, one naturally gets pretty, uh, one naturally gets reasonably nice Rabi oscillations. And this corresponds to the coherent movement of population between these two sublevels. One thing that I should immediately emphasize at this point is that unlike the NV center, the second and kind of the important interacting spin system, the P1 center, these P1 spins are not optically preparable. And it's precisely this dichotomy between the optical preparation and control of the NV center and the lack of this ability in the P1 spins that allows us to make inhomogeneous profiles. So let's now turn to this second ingredient, which is how to craft inhomogeneous spin polarization profiles in the system. And to do that, we need to start by understanding what the spin polarization dynamics of the NV center look like in the first place. And we'll start by looking at the situation where the structure, where the energy of the NV and P1 spins are off resonant from one another. And what I mean by that is that the three levels of the NV center, we're gonna think about a pair of those levels as kind of our effective two level system. This experiment, we're thinking about the zero state and the minus one state as playing the lower role of our effective two level system. And again, the P1 center is precisely a spin one half system. So it naturally has uh, two levels, spin down and spin up. In the presence of a magnetic field, we have that these levels are split but in the presence of a generic magnetic field, the energy splitting between the zero to minus one transition and the P1's down to up transition are very strongly off resonant. What I mean by strongly off resonant is that they're off resonant at the energy scale of a couple of gigahertz. And I should emphasize that the interaction strength between NV centers and P1 centers is typically on the scale of a megahertz. This means that when they're off resonant, they're kind of not talking to each other. And if one looks at the way that the NV polarization decays after one optically pumps the NV center into the MS sub zero state, one finds that there's a pretty long T1 depolarization time scale on the order of two milliseconds. And for those uh, in the audience who are familiar with NVs, this is pretty consistent with the usual kind of phonon induced lattice induced relaxation of the spin degree of freedom for the NV center. But something kind of dramatically differently, different happens when one tunes the external magnetic field to a level where the NVs and the P1s are resonant with each other. And what I mean by that is one tunes the magnetic field to a specific value, in this case, approximately 510 Gauss. And that brings the zero to minus one transition of the NV center resonant with the spin down to spin up transition of the P1 center. In this resonant configuration, what one observes experimentally is that the NV's polarization exhibits a very, very rapid decay with, I put in quotes here, uh, T1 time uh, on the order of 8.9 microseconds. And I should emphasize that this sort of, you know, really looks like something dramatic has happened. You know, you have a three order of magnitude change in the, in the sort of nominal T1 time scale. But I put quotes here precisely to emphasize that we shouldn't really think about this T1 time scale as some sort of extrinsic depolarization as we usually think about when we talk about T1 and T2 times, but rather that this T1 is some sort of a characterization of polarization transfer of the rate of polarization transfer between the NV and P1s. Really that the NV center is losing its polarization to the many body P1 ensemble via magnetic dipole dipole interactions. What this gives us is a powerful way to actually prepare local polarization profiles that are inhomogeneous via a combination of optical pumping 
and resonant interactions between the NV and P1. In particular, we can imagine that after we polarize the NV center, the NV can flip-flop with a nearby P1 center, then optical pumping repolarizes the NV center, but doesn't do anything to the P1 centers, which are dark. And then again, now the NV center can flip-flop or exhibit dipole-dipole interactions to exchange polarization with another P1 center. We can repolarize the NV center via optical pumping. And again, resonant interactions can flip another NVP1 interaction. So this type of dynamics naturally leads to the ability to prepare kind of soft polarization cores of P1 surrounding the NV center. And what I, what I mean by soft is really that in some sense, when the NV center is moving polarization, moving its polarization into the P1 center, this P1 center is also losing polarization to nearby P1 centers that surround it. So you naturally have a situation where the polarization profile, the spin polarization profile of the P1 ensemble surrounding the NV center has some sort of a peaky inhomogeneous structure that looks like this. And in some sense, as um, many of you have already realized, the entropy from the spin bath, since we're polarizing, we're, we're taking an entropy, is precisely being removed by the laser via the optical pumping process. And the emphasis is that we can control kind of the size of this polarization core surrounding the NV center by controlling the duration of how long we, end, we pump the NV center for. And typically um, in the slides that follow, we'll use that duration as a time scale tau p. So I've kind of sort of introduced two out of the four ingredients. And I wanted to stop just for a, a quick question, a quick second and ask if there are any questions at this point. Yes, we do have a couple of um, questions from the audience. So I'll start with a general question that was actually asked in different ways, both by Bill Phillips and by Alicia Kalar. Um, so Bill writes, is there a connection between the idea of er emergent hydrodynamics and the more pedestrian idea of tracing over part of the system, treating that part as a reservoir in an open system? And related Super good, to yeah, that, Alicia so asked, can I think of emergent hydrodynamics as something closely related to eigenstate thermalization hypo hypothesis that the system the is answer to both questions yeah that. the answer to both questions is is yes so let me try to um add a little bit to that intuition so of course um what i guess bill and alicia are sort of pointing to and this is exactly the right way to think about it is that you know in some sense i kind of made a distinction between this extrinsic dephasing of quantum correlations leading to kind of classical transport but in another sense, once one has a many-body system and one thinks about a local region of that many-body system, the rest of that system plays the role of the environment. And you can think about those many-body interactions with the rest of the system as doing that dephasing. Whereas, you know, so that's sort of effectively tracing out the rest of the system and thinking about um, the system behaving as a reservoir for itself. So that's precisely the way, the right way to think about this. And it's kind of means that emergent hydrodynamics is very analogous to the way we think about thermalization that in the many bodies closed system context, it's the system behaving as a bath for itself, as opposed to needing an extrinsic bath to dephase those correlations. Great. So then we have a question from Mehdi Hassan um, about uh, diffusive versus ballistic transport. So the question is, um, the interacting system behaves the same diffusive way as a classical system, like an interacting uh, quantum system can behave the same diffusive way as a classical system. So can the ballistic nature be restored by playing with the signs of the interaction or what is the intuition? Very interesting. So in general, I think the answer is, is no. Once you kind of take yourself to the strongly interacting limit, you might, so I, I guess the, the question is kind of like, is there a way to sort of average out the interactions in some, um, in some non-trivial way? So let me kind of delineate this question to two possibilities. One possibility is that you take your single particle system that's sort of you know, not uh, interacting with anything else and you elevate it to a many body system that has interactions, but you do the evolution in such a way that you kind of reverse the sign of the interactions that more or less takes it trivially back to sort of the, uh, the non-interacting limit. And in that case, you would recover ballistic transport. On the other hand, you can ask a slightly more subtle question, which is there a simple way to take a system that has a combination of positive and negative interactions, but you know, you're not canceling things out in some meaningful way, it just has positive and negative interactions. Can that 
also naturally lead to ballistic transport? And the answer most oftentimes is no, that it's very, very hard to sort of cancel out those many body interactions at some point um, in a coherent way that ends up leading to, uh, that lead, ends up leading to ballistic type transport. Great. So um, we have another question from Wen Chao Zhu, who asks, could you comment on the back action from P1 on NV? Um, if with only one, uh, if I had only one P1 and one NV, I would expect to see the polarization oscillating. Yeah, that's exactly right. So good. So um, yeah, so there's maybe, maybe two important uh, limits to this question. So if one has kind of this, um, if one has a, just a pair, one expects to kind of see coherent oscillations. And if one has a many body system, then kind of, you know, as there's coherent oscillations, the P1 is also losing its polarization to other spins. But the important thing is now that there kind of exists um, a statement about the hierarchy of scales in the problem. So if you have a situation where the interaction between the NV and the P1 is stronger than the interaction between the rest of the P1s, then you naturally have a regime where you kind of form a dimer. You really want to be in the regime where actually, you know, the, the simplest way to think about the transfer of polarization is in the limit where there's actually uh, the interaction strength between the NV and the P1 is kind of perturbative, but that slows down the rate of this transfer. And we're kind of working in the system at an intermediate situation where the NV and the P1 and P1 and other P1s are interacting at approximately the same strength. So it's sort of a complicated many body system where there's sort of back action everywhere, but there's no kind of simple limit to think about sort of polarization transfer being sort of unidirectional. It's just that the polarization transfer is happening and at the same time you're optically pumping. So this last point is particularly important. It means that if you optically pump at a rate that's too fast compared to the rate at which polarization is moving between the many body system from the NV to the P1, then you naturally Zeno suppress those polarization transfer dynamics. So it turns out you have to optically pump at a sufficiently weak rate such that you're sort of optically pumping in a way that enough polarization is moved such that it's also kind of sucked out. So there's no sort of, you know, dimer forming, but also since the end is not sort of trivially always optically pumped to a state where it doesn't allow polarization to actually transfer via the interactions. All right, so those were um, great questions and very clear answers. There are actually a couple more questions, but I think I'll hold them till um, later or the end so that Norm can continue. Sounds good, sounds good. So let me, so let's continue. So again, so where we left off was that we should think about there being this sort of, you know, NV induced inhomogeneous polarization profile of the P1s. And perhaps the most natural question to ask is how can we probe or how can we effectively see this type of a polarization profile and characterize it? And it turns out much the same technique that we've already thought about in terms of looking at initially this polarization transfer will also be a super nice diagnostic tool for us. In particular, once we optically polarize the NV center, in the situation where the P1s were totally unpolarized, so half up, half down, the NV very rapidly lost its polarization via dipole-dipole interactions. But as one starts to polarize a larger and larger core of the P1 centers, it turns out that the NV doesn't have many neighbors to be able to lose its polarization to. So what one should expect to see is that as a function of the duration of the optical pumping, which is really a duration of how long we're polarizing the P1 ensemble for, aka a width of the polarization core, we should see that the NV's depolarization time should act as a proxy of that and get longer and longer as we increase the size of this polarization core. And that's, that's exactly what we see. So in the limit of very, very short polarization times, you find that the NV decay is very rapid, much like the situation where one doesn't polarize at all. When one extends the time scale that one polarizes the P1 ensemble for, again, this polarization procedure is kind of a joint process, which involves optical pumping of the NV center, and then the NV exchanging polarization via dipole-dipole interactions with the P1 ensemble. One sees that once you make this larger polarization core, the NV has a slower T1 time scale because its neighbors are already polarized. And when one goes even longer, one sees that the NV center has an even slower kind of T1 interaction induced T1 time scale 
extending this, um, this effective T1 time scale by an order of magnitude for the longest polarization times we typically look at in the experiment. And this already kind of alludes to ingredient three, that the NV sort of functions as a local probe of the P1 ensemble's polarization. The size of this polarization profile is distinguished by different time scales for how the NV can move its polarization to this P1 ensemble. But this also begs a question. Looking at time traces like this, it's particularly hard to ask oneself, what is the time scale within the dynamics of the NV center, or by looking at this type of a probe that distinguishes between local kind of non-universal polarization dynamics and non-local sort of late time dynamics. So we'd like to be able to find some of this boundary, but it's, there's no sort of qualitative feature that allows us to distinguish between local thermalization and what we would like to characterize as emergent hydrodynamics. It turns out that getting to this fourth ingredient, mainly, namely distinguishing local thermalization, one can use kind of a simple but clever trick to start to try to create an anti-polarized configuration. And the trick uses basically um, this third spectator level of the NV center, which has thus far been absent in most of the dynamics as a shelf to store polarization. So how do we think about this? Again, we start with the procedure where the NV center polarizes some core of the P1 centers around it. And then we shell the population from the NV center into this off resonant plus one state, which is gigahertz detuned away from any other transitions in the system. Then we apply a microwave pi pulse tuned to the either this would have been the zero to minus one NV transition, which is equivalent to the down to up P1 transition because they're resonant with each other. And this pi pulse flips the polarization of the P1 centers. And then at the end, one applies an off resonant pi pulse to bring the population back to the M sub S equals zero state of the NV center. And this effectively creates an anti-polarized configuration of the NV center relative to its P1 neighbors. And what this anti-polarized configuration allows one to do precisely is it allows one to very cleanly distinguish between local thermalization and late time dynamics. In particular, one can see that the dynamics of the NV's polarization are quite different than the previous case where we had uh, the same polarization between the NV and the P1 centers. There we saw very, very slow decay. Here, there's an extremely rapid decay. There's kind of two steps of dynamics. There's an extremely rapid decay where the NV first flips its spin orientation. And it precisely flips its spin orientation because its local environment is predominantly has spin oriented opposite to it. So it, it thermalizes with its local environment becoming oppositely oriented before, after becoming oppositely oriented, it slowly follows the full P1 ensemble's dynamics. It just sort of behaves as just one of the P1 spins and basically slowly reaches equilibrium. And this allows us to kind of distinguish the thermalization time, the local thermalization time to be something on the order of, uh, of about 10 microseconds or so. With these four ingredients in hand, let me just give a little bit of a sketch of the general flavor of the types of dynamical experiments that one can imagine performing in this particular system. One has an optically addressable and optically pumpable NV center. It's surrounded by a bath of strongly interacting P1 spins, which are nominally at infinite temperature. The usual first step is to use the NV center to polarize the nearby P1 centers to generate some type of inhomogeneous spin polarization. Then we'd like to time evolve the P1 centers under their own internal strong dipole-dipole interactions. And these dipole-dipole interactions will eventually lead to some type of motion of this polarization profile, which we'd like to characterize. We've already convinced ourselves that we can then probe the polarization of the P1 centers using the NV center and we can distinguish in this probing step between local thermalization and what is sort of more the more universal regime of late time dynamics. I have sort of uh, two stars over here because it's particularly important in this kind of a uh, step two to ask ourselves, how can one be sure, you know, I emphasized the beginning and related to kind of Bill and Alicia's question, beginning that we'd really like to think about the time evolution of these P1 centers as being predominantly driven 
by the many body interactions intrinsic to the system and not by some sort of extrinsic dephasing mechanism. So it's super important to try to convince ourselves that the P1 dynamics are indeed dominated by many body interactions and that we can kind of validly think about the system as a closed quantum systems who, if there is some type of hydrodynamics at late times, it's emergent hydrodynamics coming from the sort of system behaving as a bath for itself. We can do this, uh, indeed we can do this. And in particular, we can literally look at the ensemble dephasing time scale for the P1s themselves. And this really plays, makes use of the nature of the, of the dipole-dipole interaction. In particular, it'd be nice to look at the P1 centers, the P1 spin ensemble's coherence time in two situations to determine whether or not interactions are indeed dominating the dynamics. The two situations are with the interactions on and with the interactions off. And it turns out because of the tracelessness of the dipole-dipole interaction, one can actually do this. There's um, a super nice and, uh, and well-known within the NMR community decoupling sequence for dipole-dipole interactions that cancels out the leading dipolar interaction. And this pulse sequence is known as Wahuha. And it turns out that indeed, if one doesn't decouple the interactions and one only applies kind of a, and a, gener a generic advanced spin echo decoupling sequence, XY8 in this case, one sees that the P1 ensemble coherence time is given by the light blue curve. When one uses, in this case, we're using uh, a very nice recently developed um, upgrade to the classic Wahuha sequence called DROID. This DROID pulse sequence explicitly decouples the dipole-dipole interactions and we see via the dark blue line that the coherence time is extended quite a bit. And this gives us some sort of evidence that indeed the many body interactions in the system are sort of really, literally are really dominating the dynamics of, uh, of the P1 ensemble. And that it's kind of valid to think about the system as, uh, as being described mainly by uh, coherent interactions between the spins. With this, um, and the four ingredients, let's look at how one can kind of explore the emergence of late time dynamics in the strongly interacting ensemble. And in particular, we'll make a second use of the shelving trick that I previously introduced. And the shelving trick, you know, in that case, just gave us the ability to prepare anti-polarized configurations to kind of tell ourselves what the thermalization time is. Here, we're gonna use the shelving trick to try to have time traces that explicitly distinguish between early time non-universal dynamics and late time universal behavior. So as has been the starting point for all of the talk, we'll start with the NV center polarizing some spin, homo spin distribution for the P1s. And then we'll take the NV center's population and shelve it into the plus one state we'll wait some variable duration tau d to let the dynamics of the P1 ensemble spread this polarization out. And then we'll bring the NV center's population back to the M sub S is equal zero state. So if you think about that, what that really means is that because the polarization was shelved in the state, it did not undergo exchange dipolar exchange dynamics with this P1 polarization. So all of its polarization was still being stored in this plus one state. Once we bring the polarization back to the zero state, it's effectively, you can think about it as creating a very little delta function peak of spin polarization on top of this P1 polarization, uh, on top of the P1 polarization profile. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to garner an expectation, which is that the dynamics of the NV's polarization should exhibit a two-step process. So of course, you know, in the tau D time scale, you're not seeing anything because it's shelved. But after you bring it back, there should be a, a period of rapid local relaxation where the NV center locally thermalizes with the P1. And then subsequent to that, the NV center is behaving just like a member of the P1 ensemble and is basically characterizing the time dynamics, uh, the late time dynamics of the spreading of this P1 polarization. And this kind of two-step process naturally allows us to try to isolate what is the late time physics that we're interested in. In the experiments, uh, it's exactly what we see. So in the experimental system, we start by polar with a, with a, with a held polarization time. So we polarize for um, a time scale in these experiments of 30 microseconds. 
for the first data point shown in yellow here, we also wait a time scale of 30 microseconds after shelving the NV's population. And after bringing the NV's population back, you see that the NV indeed kind of exhibits this two-step process where you have rapid relaxation followed by this um, slightly different functional form of decay. And if you wait longer, this becomes more distinct. You have a period of rapid relaxation followed by slow hydrodynamics and a period of rapid relaxation and rapid relaxation and rapid relaxation followed by a period of late time hydrodynamics. And the important thing is that for all of these plots, we're not renormalizing the tails in any way to make sure that they lie on top of each other. This comes straight out of the data. And this precisely tells us that the collapse of the tail of the dynamics allows us to consider this piece of the dynamics as the late time physics we'd like to explore as the late time physics that if there is some type of hydrodynamical description, that's where we should see it. Good, so it's this kind of, um, it's this kind of a dynamical, this, it's this piece of the dynamical data that eventually will sort of analyze and try to understand in detail what the microscopic description or the macroscopic description of the, of, the, of the dynamics are. But before we get there, I wanted to take a little bit of a, of a step back and think deeply about some of the features of the system, namely the presence of disorder and long range interactions to describe what happens to diffusion um, and how it gets modified. So let me start by just recapping conventional diffusion very quickly. So in the context of conventional diffusion, the usual age old adage is that diffusion leads to Gaussians. And what that means is that if one starts with the peak of polarization, that the peak of polarization quickly spreads to look like a Gaussian profile with a mean square displacement going linearly, growing linearly in time with a coefficient that's two times the dimension multiplied by the diffusion coefficient. A complementary way of extracting the diffusion coefficient and of characterizing conventional diffusion is by looking at something called the survival probability. And what that is, is just looking at how the height of this peak decays as a function of time. It should exhibit a universal power law for diffusion that goes as t to the dimension over two. Since we're working in 3D, this would predict t to the three halves with the slope of that power law decay being the diffusion coefficient. But unlike conventional diffusion, it turns out our system violates some of the underlying assumptions for conventional diffusion. So all I've done here is looked at the diffusion. We're gonna look at the diffusion equation in Fourier space of just Fourier transform from a polarization profile in real space to a polarization profile in K space. And here, this kind of structure factor on the right-hand side of the equation has a few very, very important characteristic remarks. The first remark is that there's no zeroth order term that trivially comes from the fact that there's a conservation of total polarization to ask about diffusion in the first place. There's only K dependence in this. There's no kind of time dependence in the structure factor over here. And that's of course, because of translational invariance in the system, uh, the assumption of translational invariance in the system. And there's also only even terms in this structure factor. And that comes from a combination, it turns out of locality in the microscopic details, as well as inversion symmetry. It turns out that our experimental platform very strongly violates the last two assumptions. In particular, the presence of disorder at the level of positional disorder, so random placement of the spins, and there'll also be on-site random fields that we'll talk about a little bit later, leads to what I'll try to convince you is a di fundamentally dynamical modification to conventional diffusion. And the presence of long range interactions leads to what I'll explain as a static modification to conventional diffusion. So let's start with a dynamical effect. How should we think about dynamics? Um, how should we think about this dynamical modification in the context of disorder? In our system, because there's a positional disorder because each of the P1 spins sees a different local environment of other P1s, translational invariance, the assumption of translational variance is locally broken. And what that means is that different local environments, you should expect to have different local diffusivities. So if you make the same type of polarization peak in different local positions, the way it spreads locally is very different and governed kind of by the local disorder environment and the local environment rather than by some sort of um, translation invariant system where there isn't disorder. 
What the physical intuition for this modification is, and which explains why it's dynamical, is that if you think about a single peak of polarization, as time goes on and this polarization spreads, it starts to average over larger and larger regions of local environment. And as it starts to average over larger and larger regions of local environment, you can kind of think, it's not quite the right way to say it, but you can kind of think of it as coarse graining out over this disorder that one has in the microscopic system. Since this averaging depends on the size of the polarization that's spreading, it has to be an intrinsically dynamical modification that knows how long time has happened. It turns this naturally means that on the sort of you know physics implications that there should be some time scale that hopefully one can characterize in the system where polarization has done enough averaging to kind of you know coarse grain out in time over this disorder distribution. Our conjecture is that this can be captured by the leading order dynamical modification of the diffusion equation. This modification you can see has time dependence explained explicitly. So it's a dynamical modification as has to be from the physical intuition. And this uh, dynamical modification is the leading order modification that's allowed given basically conservation and analyticity if one imposes those constraints. It turns out that this dynamical modification leads to a pretty dramatic um, change in uh, conventional diffusion. In particular, it kind of changes and, and goes against the adage that diffusion leads to Gaussians. And in particular, one rather gets diffusion where the profile of the polarization looks very much like a Yukawa, like what you know as Yukawa potential. So it looks like uh, an exponential over a power law. And in particular, we believe that this positional disorder, if one has positional disorder in a system, that this non-Gaussian profile should be extremely long-lived on the order of sort of thousands of hopping timescales of the Bayer experiment. It turns out something very related, although I can't put my finger exactly on whether or not it can be driven by the same kind of long wavelength description here, something very related is seen in, in many different systems which exhibit so-called Fickian yet non-Gaussian diffusion. And that's sort of you know exponential profiles of nominally diffusive systems in systems ranging from biology systems to glass transitions to colloids, et cetera. So that's the consequence of the dynamical modification. And the static modification um, from the long range interactions naturally also leads to a modification of the diffusion equation. And in this case, I think many of you are familiar with thinking about the power law decay of the interactions, in our case, one over R cubed because of dipoles, as naturally being compared with dimensionality. And indeed, the static modification of long range interactions leads to a correction to the diffusion equation that goes as K to the alpha minus D. And this naturally leads to three regimes. When this correction alpha minus D is stronger than the leading order behavior one over DK squared, long range interactions dominate over diffusions, and this leads to Levy flights. When this K correction is larger than K to the fourth, diffusion is kind of hardly modified at all. But there's an intrinsic kind of intermediate regime where long range interactions lead to a parametrically slower approach to equilibrium than is allowed in the absence of long range interactions. Um, so that's the kind of, uh, and, and it turns out that's the kind of regime that we think the system is, is ultimately in. Uh, let me take a step now to, to, to ask for questions again. I think there's, there's only, or I know we're running a little bit late, Monica. But, That's right. Uh, yeah. So um, maybe I'll just ask a couple of quick questions to let you. Um, we have one from Junhee Choi, um, who asks, what limits the T1 time at long NV pumping duration in your system? Um, it seems like the measured T1 value is still limited to 50 microseconds at a pumping duration of one millisecond. Um, could it be related to the T1 time of the P1 centers? Yeah, we're not, we're not sure. So that's a, it's a very good question. So what Junhee is saying is basically that um, nominally T1 from phonons is a millisecond, but we see that, you know, even when we're sort of pumping uh, as much polarization as we can, that, you know, the polarization, the extension of the T1 time kind of only leads to uh, something on the order of 100 microseconds. And the answer is, is sort of twofold. At ultimately, you're still only creating a soft core of polarization. So there are unpolarized P1s that suck out the envy's polarization. And the reason why you can't make this polarization core infinitely large is because you're limited by the duration that you can optically pump for. 
And that limit is precisely set by the T1 time of the P1s. So if the T1, if the P1s had no T1 time, then you could just keep optically pumping. And at some point, all of the P1s would be perfectly polarized, at which point the NVs polarized deep T1 time should reach the phonon limited lifetime. But because you can't polarize the T1s for an infinite amount of time, in the duration that you can polarize for, you don't get full polarization. So you still ultimately are depolarizing from the NVP1 interaction, and it's not phonon limited. Great. And um, Bill Phillips asked, since the separation between P1, P1 spacing and NVP1 spacing is only about cube root of 100, yeah. is there an issue when the soft polarization radius of the P1 bath overlaps with a neighboring NV center? Yeah, God, that's that's super sharp. Yeah. So it turns out that we 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 see that actually. So um, wow, yeah. So it turns out that we are in the regime at the longest pumping times, where indeed the polarization um, bubbles start to overlap, and there's kind of an overall polarization background that comes from this overlap. And that overall polarization background has nowhere to move. Dipolar dynamics can't change that. So the only way that polarization background decays is via the T1 time of the P1s, and that's again phonon limited. So what we have to do is we ultimately, in order to see kind of the dynamics of this on top of that, we have to subtract off the T1 decay, but it's sort of easy to do by looking at the experiments and just subtracting off the late time T1 decay of an overall polarization bath. Incidentally, that kind of overall polarization is gives you kind of a length scale in the problem and is what allows you to kind of get out the diffusion coefficient from our data. Okay, so um, we actually have more questions coming in, but I want you to be able to continue. We might save some of these for the end, and we also will have a chance for a direct discussion with Norm um, after the talk. So, so why don't we keep going now because we're at 12.57, and it would be great if you can wrap up in the next five-ish minutes. Is that doable, Norm? I think, I think that's doable. I, I, I won't promise, but I think that's doable. I will try my best. Um, so good. So now that we have some sort of expectations, that basically um, the disorder should induce very, very different looking profiles and the long range interactions should induce a different approach to equilibration. Let's take a look at what we actually see. So again, just to remind ourselves, we are going to be looking at this kind of late time piece of the dynamics. And since, and we're gonna be looking at that late time piece is just replotting that data in a log log plot. And what we find is that this kind of, you know, what I've said, written here is the, sort of the survival probability. This is kind of the NV's polarization, which is really tracking the height of the P1 ensemble after sort of uh, after the local equilibration time. What we find is actually that at late times, the data exhibits almost a decade of power law behavior that's pretty consistent with the diffusive expectation, the universal diffusive expectation in three dimensions, which is T to the minus three halves. And actually, a combination of this um, combination of this background polarization decay that Bill is asking about, and the slope of this allows to determine a diffusion coefficient for the system, a spin diffusion coefficient for the system, which is about 0.34 nanometer squared per microsecond. Uh, without going to very much detail, one can observe, look at these different types of um, uh, diffusion power laws in a number of different scenarios. One can tune the effective density of the spins, the spacing between the P1 spins by using the hyperfine structure. One can also tune the amount of on-site disorder in the system by driving the spin bath. And in each of these different scenarios, one can get a, uh, a diffuse, one can extract a diffusion coefficient from the late time decay um, of the survival probability as measured via the NV's polarization. But for those, um, for those, some of you are, are, are noticing already um, an important question, which is why should this data look diffusive at all? I just gave kind of a, an introduction to the intuition that the static long range correction for dipolar interactions in 3D should fall into this ultra long range limit. Alpha is three from dipolar interactions, dimensions also three, where long range interactions dominate over, levy, dominate over diffusion but yet it seems like the data is consistent with diffusion at the longest timescales at sort of, you know, millisecond timescales. And this 
motivates us to think very, very carefully, to think a little bit more carefully of what exactly is the correct description of the dynamics of polarization within the system. And in particular, let's focus on thinking about the dynamics of polarization exchange between two P1 spins. It's no longer NVP1, it's not pumping, it's thinking about how the dynamics actually moves in the system. When we focus on these two P1 spins, of course, the Hamiltonian that drives the dynamics is the dipole-dipole interaction. And the thing that allows you to move spin density around is the flip-flop piece of the dipole-dipole interaction. But there's also this Ising piece. And it turns out because of the way, because of the hyperfine structure ultimately, the Ising interactions in this Hamiltonian are parametrically stronger than the P1, than the flip-flop interactions. And this means that from a mean field picture, there's kind of an effective local magnetic field at the location of each P1 center coming from its neighbors that generates a random local magnetic field, which in general is larger than the size of the flip-flop interaction coming from the dipole-dipole Hamiltonian. And in this off-resonant limit, one can do a super simple kind of Fermi's golden rule calculation to derive that the polarization exchange rate between two P1 spins I and J happens at second order imperturbation theory. So it's driven by this matrix element of the flip-flop P squared, and then gamma over gamma squared plus delta squared, where delta squared is precisely the off-resonant condition, and gamma squared is the uh, dephasing time scale. You can think about it as the XY8 spin echo time scale of the P1 ensemble. This exactly, for those of you familiar, should look at the rate, should look like the rate of optical pumping. And that's precisely because, you know, you think of this uh, interaction as the Rabi frequency, this as kind of the line width for the, for the particular transition, and delta as the uh, off resonance between, uh, between the drive and the, and the line. With this type of a uh, polarization transfer rate, one can get a very, very simple kind of semi-classical description of the polarization dynamics just by thinking about the polarization dynamics driven by differences of polarization between sites. And ultimately, this type of a uh, semi-classical model allows us to reproduce the late time dynamics of the experiments remarkably well. So these are not fits, these are actually a model for the polarization, the late time polarization dynamics as a function of different pumping time scales. This is for two different densities. So the difference between these two plots here on the experimental side is that the average spacing between the P1s is different. This gives us confidence that the microscopic, the sort of, you know, the polarization dynamics are indeed kind of driven by this type of a, by this type of a gamma. And in particular, it also gives us insight into why the system, because of this, is not really in this kind of levy flight regime. It's because effectively the polarization dynamics are actually governed by an interaction decay, a power law that's one over R to the six instead of one over R cubed. So the effective power law is alpha equals six. With such an effective power law six and a dimension three, it turns out that this system is precisely in kind of the marginally intermediate long range regime where one expects a change to the diffusion equation, which looks like a K cubed correction to the diffusion equation. An interesting question is whether or not we can see this in the data. So the, 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 the gray dashed line is a fit to conventional diffusion and the red line is a fit to long range diffusion. It fits a little bit better for a couple of data points, but those data points are kind of pretty close to the local thermalization time. So I think it's very hard to say that there's any clear evidence in the data that, um, that you can see this K cubed correction um, and the deviation from conventional diffusion. On the other hand, the semi-classical uh, rate equation also allows us to carefully look at what the polarization profile looks like as a function of time. And in that case, we do see something that's pretty dramatic. That here, the polarization profile in the experiments actually looks very, very un-Gaussian like. Notice that now instead of a log-log plot, it's a semi-log plot with only the y-axis being logged. So this is very, very close to an exponential kind of Yukawa type profile. What this allows us to do is to actually extract what the coefficient C dynamical is in the experimental system. We think it's something on the order of 58 nanometers squared. So this is a length squared. Combining this length squared and the diffusion coefficient, which is units of nanometers squared per microsecond, 
do you naturally get this time scale that I promised? And in particular, it's intuitively the physical time scale where the polarization has done enough averaging to kind of coarse grain in time over this order. And you find out that that time scale is something on the order of 170 microseconds. And you would expect that for time evolutions much larger than that, that you slowly start to see that the Yukawa potential profile ultimately ends up bending towards a Gaussian. And this is indeed the case that when you look at 200 microseconds, the profile is rather Yukawa. But at 600 microseconds up to a millisecond, you start to see the late time bending uh, towards, uh, towards the Gaussian profile, where the system has kind of a single peak of polarization has spread enough such that it's averaging over many, many different local diffusion coefficients. Um, okay, with that, maybe let me not go to the outlook, but just summarize that I hope I've explained um, and, and told you a little bit about our, our system, which is a hybrid spin system that makes it possible to see some of the physics of unconventional disorder, coming unconventional diffusion coming from a combination of disorder effects and the interplay and that interplay with long range interactions. Let me uh, just end by uh, acknowledging the, the people who really did the, did the work. So the experiments were, were, were led by Chong Zhu, Francisco Machado, Bing Tian and Sun Wan. And this is, uh, you know, on the theory side, it's a culmination of a, a number of really, really nice collaborations with some good friends of mine, Chris Lauman and Joel Moore. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Norm. So we'll take a few more questions here. So there was one um, a little earlier in the talk. I'm still a little confused about the difference between the thermalization and the diffusion to the P1 bath. Um, so this is a question from Jue Yue uh, Zhang. The thermal time scale is 10 microseconds. Is that the same as the rapid initial decay in the shelving measurement? Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I think, you know, yeah, somehow maybe maybe my diction hasn't been hasn't been precise enough. So in some sense, you know, thermalization is happening the entire time scale. But really the emphasis on sort of, you know, looking at this anti-polarized thing is to distinguish between kind of local thermalization and global thermalization. And in some sense, that's what we mean by hydrodynamics. It's thinking about how a system evolves from local equilibrium to global equilibrium. But we want to know sort of, you know, when we're looking at this late time scale and when we're looking at the early time scale. So tau therm is the time scale it takes for the NV center to reach local equilibration with the P1 ensemble. And then thermalization afterwards, the NV center is just tracking the polarization decay or the thermalization of the entire P1 ensemble. And that's what I would call kind of global relaxation or global thermalization. Great. So um, Ning Yuan Jia asks, can you use multiple NV centers to probe the transport properties? Yeah, super cool. That's something um, we've talked about in, in the group and it would, be, it would be fantastic. So I think what Ming is thinking about is an experiment I would love to do. It has some challenges, but it would be really cool is to, instead of kind of averaging at the moment, we're sort of, you know, doing an ensemble experiment. So we're averaging over all of the signal for many, many different NV centers. The NV centers are, as I said, 20 nanometers apart. The optical diffraction spot that we have is like, you know, half a micron or so. So you're really averaging over lots of NV centers. But if you could have better optical resolution and you could imagine preparing polarization at one NV center because you have sort of local resolution and then watching that polarization get transferred via the P1 bath to this other ensemble, then that's when you can really in the experiment directly extract what the polarization profile looks like and try to see whether or not these kind of you know, signatures of unconventional diffusion, whether or not it's described by this you know, universal long wavelength conjectured correction, I think that would be really, really cool. But that's something that I think would be very powerful, but it requires one to have kind of, at least to get to the limit of strong interactions, it requires one to have um, yeah, some amount of sub-diffraction optical control. Great. So um, Dan Stamper Kern asks, diffusion of spin is of course something that is studied and utilized extensively in NMR. For example, it's a staple of magnetic resonance imaging. So what is new here? Or similarly, what aspects of this problem have been studied previously in other NMR systems? Um, yeah, is so there actually, something special, right, about the diamond spin setup? that makes these studies more quantitative or more connected to quantum physics? Super important question. It turns out what's actually new is uh, what only was sort of one of the two pieces of this, um, 
one of the two pieces of uh, the modifications. So in most of the NMR studies, I think almost all of the ones that we know about, um, the experiments are done on nuclear spins on an ordered lattice. So most of the time you have some sort of nuclear spin, you know, some isotope that has nuclear spin and that lives on an ordered lattice. And people have seen spin diffusion. So David Corey's group has done some really beautiful measurements looking at spin diffusion in, in these types of systems. But it turns out in the NV system and in this you know, electronic spin system, you kind of naturally have strong positional disorder. I don't think it would be impossible to have such a scenario in NMR systems, but that's the kind of difference to the types of NMR experiments that have previously been done exploring spin diffusion. I'm actually going to ask a related question. So in these NMR experiments, there are tr tricks like multiple quantum coherence to gain some information about kind of correlations in the system. So are those things that could be applied here to get yeah, more deep? It's something we it's something we've thought about. It's some it's something we've definitely thought about. So yeah, so so multiple quantum coherences, you know, give you some insight into higher order correlation functions of the system, higher order autocorrelation functions of the system. Um, it's something we've thought about. We don't yet have a good sense, to be honest, that the multiple quantum coherences give you something qualitatively distinct in terms of information in the protocol that we're looking at. But I think in different protocols, I think in slightly more floquet protocols that we've thought about where one can sort of alternate between time evolution with different Hamiltonians, we think that multiple quantum coherences of those situations do give you access to more information. Great. So now um, I'll ask a, quest, a broad question that was actually asked early in the talk by somebody who goes by the initials AP, which is, can you map the emergent hydrodynamics in a quantum system to the hydrodynamics associated with gravity or vice versa? Very subtle. Okay, so let's be careful. So gravity is, um, okay, so when we talk about hydrodynamics of gravity, at least, you know, if you, if you Google hydrodynamics of gravity, there's lots of papers, but it turns out gravity, the pure gravitational theory is one that in general, I don't think about as having a hydrodynamic limit. So gravity, you know, at its core is a purely attractive sort of, you know, kind of a one over R type thing. And this means that in some sense, that is precisely in the regime where, you know, all of the intuition about this diffusion equation, if you want to think about an equation, the equation breaks down because you have these very, very long range interactions that are attractive. But it also means basically that there's no kind of interesting equilibrium in some sense. So gravity, when you have just that attractive force and nothing else, everything just collapses, right? There's a reason why we have black holes. But usually when one thinks about gravity in situations where one reaches some type of interesting stable equilibrium, you need some other type of conservation law. Maybe it's angular momentum, maybe it's something else. But those are the types of situations where one has that. And oftentimes I think about, you know, hydrodynamics of gravity as being sort of starting with a hydrodynamical theory and asking how gravitational interactions perturbatively correct on top of that hydrodynamical theory. I think gravity is sort of one of those limits of, you know, classical interactions where one doesn't really have a natural notion of equilibrium in the pure gravitational theory. And thus one doesn't naturally have a notion of truly intrinsic hydrodynamics in that system either. Great. So um, with that, I think we really should um, thank Norm again at this point so that we still have some time for people to discuss with you informally after the talk. Um, so thanks, Norm, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have just posted a link to the post-seminar discussion in the chat. Um, hopefully everybody received that. But before you go there, let me let Dan wrap up. Okay, so let me just conclude by uh, again thanking Norm and then announcing the talks that are coming up uh, in the coming week. The Quantum Science Seminar uh, hosted by our colleagues in Europe will be uh, featuring Anna Maria Ray, who will be speaking uh, on Thursday. You see that's 5 p.m. Uh, European Central Time. And then the Vamos Seminar will be featuring our European colleague, Zelim Joachim, um, and this will be at the same time uh, next week. So thanks everybody. Look forward to seeing you at the post-seminar discussion and uh, have a great weekend.